That's right, we got one. The Intel i5-12400. It's a confidential, technically, CPU right now, meaning that it's an engineering sample. So we were able to purchase two i5-12400ES, or engineering sample CPUs. We got a 12700i7 non-K, also not released yet, and the 12900 non-K, also, also not released yet. So we got several CPUs that aren't out yet. We are looking at one of them today, the 12400. We'll tell you about the other two while we go through this. And uh, it gives you a, sort of an early look at benchmarks for where Intel will land for CPUs that it technically hasn't released. But there are some major caveats here, and we'll be going over why you should be careful if you're buying an engineering sample CPU. Before that, this video is brought to you by Squarespace. We use Squarespace for our own GN store and juggle complex multi-piece orders all the time with it. Squarespace makes it fast for us to roll out new products with detailed pages full of galleries, videos, and descriptors. It's also useful for your own resume sites, for photographer or project portfolios, or for starting your new small business idea. There's never been a better time to try and start your new business than right now. And we can vouch that Squarespace makes it easy. Visit squarespace.com slash gamersnexus to get 10% off your first purchase with Squarespace. So for these CPUs, there's plenty of them on eBay, on AliExpress, and basically any other secondhand seller website right now. Engineering sample CPUs are pretty common to find sort of in the field, which is not how Intel intends them to be found. They're meant to go only to exclusive partners. Those would be companies like Gigabyte, Asus, MSI, Basically, anyone who has to develop a product, a cooler company as, as well, that might involve an early sample of a CPU that's not yet ready. These early samples are typically referred to as either ES for engineering sample or a QS sample, which is sort of a qualification version of the CPU, as opposed to the later launched retail samples, which do not have any special suffix other than their usual suffixes that might apply like K. So here's Intel's list of its official policy on engineering samples. It basically says they're the property of Intel. It says they're confidential. This isn't really surprising. It says they're typically under NDAs or loan agreements, and they're not for sale or resale. Intel is very clear in its list that it doesn't warrant the CPUs, nor does it uh, consider them as having passed their requirements for the CPU. So what we have here is something that's not really going to perform to the full 12400 spec. A couple things, though. Engineering samples often are completely up to spec. They're not limited in any way in many of the use cases in the past. Most of our CPUs that we get from Intel for reviews ahead of launch are considered engineering samples and are stamped with the Intel Confidential right across the IHS. Difference with those is they're cleared for reviews, they are fully enabled, uh, and they work just as a retail sample would, except they're maybe a month or so ahead of the retail sample so they can get them out to media and their other partners like motherboard vendors early. These ones that we bought, they might be fused off in hardware artificially. Uh, Intel might be doing that in order to intentionally restrict the performance so that there aren't leaks of data, which we would be doing today if we would be the source of that if, uh, if it weren't completely restricted. Or they could be restricted in something like BIOS, so it's an artificial restriction that once the retail sample comes out and BIOS is officially released for these CPUs, perhaps they will become fully enabled and unlocked. If that happens, we'll let you know. Anyway, we were able to buy two identical 12400ES CPUs called QXDY. These are six core 12 thread chips. They are all performance cores, so there's zero E cores. Also, as expected though, we immediately had difficulty getting the CPUs to boot in our test bench. We couldn't get any display out from the GPUs with it installed in the primary PCIe slot. Now that's postcode D6. Postcode D6 is extremely well known at this point. It just means no video out, no GPU device detected, uh, and it's fairly standardized across most of the boards. So the IGP did work. And that was a good indication to us that the CPU itself is functional. It wasn't just a pure scam of a dead CPU to us. It actually would work if we could figure it out. Installing a GPU in any slot that used the PCH instead of the CPU PCIe lanes was successful. So if you don't know, quick primer for you educational piece here, but imagine a block diagram where you've got the CPU here and the PCH or the chipset down here, platform controller hub. The CPU has its own lanes that go straight to the GPU. It also has lanes that go over and down to the PCH via DMI, another interface. And the chipset then has lanes that can go to GPUs, but not to the same ones. So typically what you have is the top slot is wired as PEG or PCIe graphics to the CPU directly. And that's your best communication link between the CPU and the GPU. You'll get the fastest information transfer there, communication, because there's no 
interface in, in between. There's no go between PCH middleman, basically, that then has another interface via DMI to the CPU. So that's typically how it works. Uh, it's definitely how everything works in the current generations of both AMD and Intel. There's some naming changes, but it's the same idea. So that's how it goes together. Now, because PEG was not working, in other words, PCIe graphics off the CPU was disabled, which we're assuming was probably an intentional decision by Intel to restrict benchmarking capabilities of people like us who might get our hands on one early without them wanting us to. Because that was turned off, we had to use the PCH. Unfortunately, this does not produce useful data for an actual review of how the CPU will actually perform once it comes out, because we are going through a significantly limited interface with a lower class of PCIe, fewer lanes, through a chipset via DMI doesn't give us great graphics capabilities, uh, the bandwidth is reduced, and so it's not a good way to judge the CPU's GPU connectivity performance, which would be any gaming scenario. However, we can still benchmark the CPU with relative confidence that it will represent the final product with one key difference, which is that Intel was also tricky here. So what Intel did here was restrict the cache ratio, and we'll come back to that. Now, for the GPUs, we found that uh, updating BIOS had no effect. Both CPUs behaved the same way. The 12400, the 12700 behaved the same way. The ES version, the 12900 ES behaved the same way. So they all have this restriction. And we also checked on two motherboards. We used an ASUS Z690 board, that's the Strix eGaming. And we used an MSI Z690 Carbon, which is a really high-end board. And the CPU PCIe slots didn't work for either. So we used the Strix Z690 eGaming for testing because it's one of the few boards that has a full-length PCIe Gen 4 PCH derived slot. It looks like an X8 slot, but it's actually wired for by 4 by 4 It's complicated and was kind of a pain in the ass to figure out. The bottom line is that we were forced to test with an RTX 3080 running at PCIe Gen 4, which is fine, except it's by 4 We were able to see that the boost clocks were lower than the rumored retail clocks. Our samples have an 800 megahertz base clock and a max at 40x or 4 gigahertz on one to two cores. They're 38x on three to four cores, and they're 36x on five to six cores. The rumor is 4.4 gigahertz for one core and a max all core boost of 4.0 gigahertz. So pretty big difference there, a couple hundred megahertz uh, across the stack for, between the rumors and the engineering sample. PL2 defaulted to 117 watts on our chip with a tau period of 28 seconds for that one. That's the period after which the turbo boosting max duration expires and it drops in the power consumption and therefore the frequency. PL1 defaults to 65 watts. It's a safe bet that that's the true TDP of the retail chip, very likely at this point. Uh, it's also likely that the tau and the PL2 uh, limits are accurate, but we'll see. Examining the log file for a blender run shows the CPU holding at 3.6 gigahertz all core for just over the listed tau period of 28 seconds and then dropping to a range of 3.2 gigahertz to 3.4 gigahertz for the remainder of the test due to the power limits. The CPU stayed reasonably cool in this time, but we're not gonna go over that in detail here today. Logging during a Cinebench R20 single-threaded pass shows a constant maximum core clock of four gigahertz with all cores ranging between 3.6 and four gigahertz for the duration of the test, confirming the turbo numbers reported by software. Despite Intel's very firm no sale or resale rules on paper, it is actually extremely easy to find these on eBay and elsewhere and often they behave the exact same as retail units, but this one doesn't. So what we come back to here is just some consumer advice of if you're looking for a CPU maybe a little bit early, uh, don't expect it to perform as it should. We will come back and let you know though if they magically work once the final BIOS comes out. Maybe it'll unrestrict itself, but we're guessing it's probably fused off somewhere in the silicon, which would not be a fixable change. Power testing is one of the more interesting things that we can do with these CPUs. Less power, less heat, less noise, smaller coolers. It's all good for something like an HCPC. If the QXDY samples don't end up getting higher boost caps or getting dumped in a landfill, their most practical use would be running a low power IGP equipped home server or home theater PC. So this might be an actually useful scenario for these specific ES models uh, if they end up getting sold for cheaper once the real ones come out. Don't pay full retail for these. We paid about full retail, roughly $200 for them, 180 or so. Uh, it's not worth that, but Maybe after the real ones launch, it'll come down and then it's useful as a sort of secondary PC. So here's the chart then. Unlike the Alder Lake CPUs we've tested thus far, these 12400 ES chips have that distinct PL1 and 2 value. 
a constant feature of previous Intel CPU generations. The power limits, or the PLs, are what show you a hard drop in frequency once something's been running for, say, 56 seconds traditionally. Checking CPU power consumption directly at the EPS 12 volt cable after five minutes of sustained load showed a value of 73 watts. That's much lower than the 12600K's 119 watt result, and it's close to the listed 65 watt TDP for the CPU. Even so, Andy's highly efficient mid-range 5000 CPUs manage even better numbers, like the 5600X with its really impressive 64 watts, or the 5800 non-X also impressively low. Cinebench R20 multi-threaded shows us the peak short-term power consumption of 94 watts. That's below the CPU's allotted power budget of 117 watts, but it's not perfectly accurate since we're measuring before VRM efficiency losses. The R23 test showed the same result, but we're not producing that number in this data today. This is still one of the lower power numbers on our chart for this test, but AMD's advantage is even stronger here with a 66 watt reading for the 5600X. Single threaded, the power draw was 30 watts on par with a 9900K. The 12400 contains no E cores, so there's no possibility of a hybrid architecture advantage here. We'll start our production benchmarks with Blender Cycles rendering on the CPU, where the score is in minutes and lower is better. Keeping in mind that the cache ratio is limited here, at least a little bit, our engineering sample finished the render in 28 and a half minutes, requiring 7% less time than the i5-11400 CPU. Since this is a zero E-core CPU, the core and the thread count are the same between the two, leaving the difference to be architectural and, of course, frequency driven. The 12400 engineering sample is outperformed by the R5-3600 here, which completes the render 14% faster. We'll be curious, though, to see if the retail sample can catch up to the R5-3600, seeing as that was the rough price equivalent for many years. The i5-12600K stock CPU completes the render 47% faster than the ES, making a big enough gap that even retail updates won't really close that distance, but it's also an expected gap to have. This is about where we expected the 12400ES to perform for a CPU-only workload. So this gives probably the best preview we're going to get to the 12400's future CPU-only performance. Our Chromium compile test is next. This is entirely CPU and I.O. bound, so the limited PEG capabilities don't come into play here. But the cache ratio obviously will. The 12400ES required 124 minutes to complete the compile, a 3% time reduction from the 11400 previous gen CPU. As for the R5-3600 comparison, that one required 12% less time to compile than the 12400. Hopefully, we'll see the results closer to parity on the final shipping sample, but even still, if AMD doesn't have its own $200 part, this one will be the de facto winner of its price class. The 12400, at least the ES, isn't particularly impressive, but for an engineering sample with features clearly disabled, it's doing well for its price class, or future intended price class. In our 7-zip compression benchmark, the Intel i5-12400ES ran at 52,000 MIPS, or millions of instructions per second, and that's compared to the 11400's 59,000 MIPS. That puts the 12400ES behind the 11400, allowing the 11400 to compress about 12% more content per second than the 12400ES. This is where we're starting to see the engineering sample part of the name come into play. <laughs> it's pretty hard. It's clearly underperforming, as it shouldn't be worse than the 11400, and it wasn't worse previously in the last two tests. But the reduction cash ratio and whatever other features we may not be able to see that have been modified by Intel, that's what's resulting in the deficiency. In decompression, the 12400ES also ended up at the bottom of the charts. It's severely behind here at 54K MIPS versus 66K MIPS on the previous 11400, affording the last-gen CPU a lead of 22%, and that's not one we suspect will stick around once the retail sample ships. The R5-3600 therefore leads by 40%, and that's another uncharacteristically large gap, even for AMD's advantages in some of the 7-zip tests. However, it's a big enough jaunt that we would expect it to maintain a lead even with the retail sample 12400. We'll see, but picking up 40% here doesn't seem likely. This set of benchmarks is a great example for why buying an engineering sample as an end user can sometimes be risky, although it can be okay, it just... Depends on which one you get, and since it's not guaranteed to have any mark of performance, it's a gamble. Both of our ES 12400s do this, so we'd suspect that all of the ES units of this production run likely have the same hard restrictions on performance. Now, they do multiple production runs of engineering samples, so maybe you'll get lucky and get one that's fully enabled, but we wouldn't necessarily gamble on it. Photoshop is where the GPU starts to really affect the overall score, despite having several largely CPU-bound tasks and filters. The GPU still gets used 
in the Adobe Suite. The 12400 ES plummets in ranking here, down at 794 points overall score. The 3600 is about 9% ahead of the 12400 ES, and the 11400 is a massive 20% ahead, clearly because of the limited ES performance. Not shown here in this chart, the GPU score that we collected was just 68 for the 12400 ES, whereas everything else is significantly higher, anywhere from 80 to 100 plus, depending on the CPU and the generation of PCIe and so forth. So that'd be the PEG limitations affecting the performance of the GPU. Adobe Premiere will be even more limited in performance because of the PEG restrictions. The 12400ES scored 553 points overall here, allowing the 11400 to outdo it by 17%. The R5 3600 is similarly ahead of the 12400ES. Unfortunately, for both Premiere and Photoshop, we'll have to wait for the retail sample to get a real gauge of performance. This is not an accurate representation with these two of the 12400 retail sample, but at least the first two tests give us kind of more of a ballpark of where it might land. The real takeaway thus far is be careful with buying engineering samples. Now for gaming, we did run our entire test suite of games. We're not going to produce all the results because we found out, obviously, that this isn't representative of retail, but just for point of reference, these game benchmarks will give you an idea of where the QXDUI engineering sample performance lands. And there are plenty of these on eBay right now, so someone out there might be thinking about buying this. Red Dead was one of the best results on our sample for the CPU at 144 FPS average and with stable 1% and 0.1% lows. This puts it right above the AMD R7 3700X, while last generation's i5 11400 outperforms it by 7.3%. That might give an indication as to how the rest of our CPU benchmarks went. Because we rely on the GPU for gaming benchmarks, even if the CPU is the target of the test, the PCH-connected GPU will limit performance. The combination of a restricted CPU clock and our inability to install the GPU in a proper full X16 slot means that these CPUs will not excel at gaming. Counter-Strike Global Offensive was one of the few games we tested which performed poorly, but which had near-identical average FPS at 1080 and 1440, which under normal circumstances, would definitely indicate a CPU bottleneck. We can't be so certain with this unusual bench setup, but we can say that the 11400 outperforms the newer Alder Lake sample by a full 26% at 238 FPS average versus the 12400ES's 188 FPS average. That applies to the 1440p test as well. It's the same, but we'll skip that chart. So although it's possible that this is somewhat how it'll unfold once the real thing comes out, and we're not being coy here, we don't can't tell you, we don't know, uh, realistically, what's going on is the 12400ES is severely restricted. The 12700ES is also restricted. That's the non-K, so it's not out yet, technically. The 12900 non-K ES, same thing. So we have a lot of engineering samples in-house. Some of them we've bought online over the years. Some we've bought from AliExpress many years after the CPU came out, uh, like some of the Xeon CPUs we have. We also have a ton of them from Intel itself. We have similar ones from AMD. Uh, so just saying confidential or engineering sample doesn't necessarily mean it's restricted, but at least with QXDY here, our recommendation is to not buy them on eBay or AliExpress or wherever right now. There are a lot of them out there. It might be compelling to buy them because you can get them, at least these ones when we bought maybe a month or so ago, we got for about $200, which is pretty close to the cheapest modern CPU you can get right now since AMD has sort of abandoned that market. Intel's not there yet, officially. However, all that said, because of the PCIe graphics limitations for the first slot, and because of the frequency boosting limitations, because of the cache ratio hard limits that we suspect will perhaps lift once the real CPU comes out, we would recommend just not buying one of these. Um, it's fun for a preview. It's kind of interesting as an academic look at things but uh, we do suspect the actual 12400 results will be higher, so you should not consider this data to be representative of the 12400 retail. I know we've said that like three times now, but it's really important that that's the message that gets across. So uh, anyway, kind of interesting. If you're thinking of buying one, there's your answer on whether you should or not, and if you have one, well, there's your answer on how you can get the graphics to work at least. Uh, since that was kind of our problem with it. So we have no conclusion on whether the 12400 is worth it because this isn't retail. We will be back with the real retail version once it's ready. Intel hasn't sent them out yet. We've actually not even heard from Intel yet. We're technically not even under any kind of embargo, NDA, or anything else because we haven't heard about it. So uh, we don't know when that's going to be. Probably after CES sometime, which is in the next few weeks. Thanks for watching. As always, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help us out directly where you can grab our brand new red and black mouse maps. <laughs>
These are in a HUD design. They look super cool. We got the first couple photos in from those of you who received them early on Twitter, and they look awesome in your setups. Thank you for supporting us, and we're happy that you all are getting something high quality that you like in return. You can always go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus for some behind-the-scenes stuff. We'll see you all next time.